uh, being out of town, and uh, we're thankful for their uh, service and their servant heartedness in our music ministry. I uh, heard a lot of good comments about the duct tape gift, and so thankful for that. Very practical. I'm glad that it was uh, something that uh, the men enjoyed. We're keeping several back for some men who are out of town this weekend, but uh, we do have some extras. Maybe they can be put to use around the building, maybe for the restroom expansion or, or something. No, no, just kidding, just kidding. But uh, we do have several we're going to hang on to because there are some men who are out today. We'll make sure they get uh, each get one. But I'm glad that that was uh, uh, a help and an encouragement to our men. Ephesians chapter number 5, Ephesians chapter number 5. We are looking at another one another principle tonight as we have been working our way through several. There are over 30 one another statements in scripture and we will not look at all of them. Some of them overlap. Some of them are repetitive. We look at sometimes two or three of them in a single passage uh, because there's so much overlap. But I do want to distinguish Ephesians 5 and verse 21 a little bit differently from some of the others, though again there will be some repetition. Ephesians 5 and verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. So as we look at submission to one another, again we have to look at the context. We know that Ephesians chapters 1 through 3 is a very doctrinal book. We then get to chapters 4 through 6 and we see a lot more of the practical application of those doctrines. We see how the doctrine then affects our duty, how our belief affects our behavior, how principle affects our practice. What we believe ultimately and what we think ultimately comes out in the way we live. And whenever there is talk about doctrine dividing, I think that that is a wrong statement because doctrine should unify because everybody has a belief system that they operate by. Everybody has a worldview that they operate by. And we need to make sure our worldview is biblical and our doctrine, our belief, our principle is based on the Word of God and that we live by the principles of the Word of God, the doctrine of the Word of God, and our beliefs are based on the Bible. But in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, after we read, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, he then, by the inspiration of God, writes... Paul does to the church at Ephesus, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. We see that it's in the fear of God. There is a reverence for God, a respect for God. There is a desire to do what pleases God and a desire not to do what displeases Him. But this term, submission, we're going to look first of all at submission defined. It is a military term. It means to line up under. It has the idea of a chain of command. Now, I am not a military veteran. I looked this up. Uh, My mom and dad were both in the army, and my mom served in the Women's Army Corps, stationed out in Tucson, Arizona for, I forget how long she said, my dad was in the army, and uh, they both ended up out in California, and that's where they Uh, met and got married, and then my sister and I were born there, but I'm a Hoosier. But my dad would talk about, my dad would talk about the army and the chain of command. And one of the things around our house is because they said yes sir and no sir, yes ma'am and no ma'am, for so many times in the military, (laughs) they decided that in around our house, they were not going to be ma'am and sir. We still were told and taught respect, believe me. And I'm thankful for that. But so my dad wasn't sir, my mom wasn't ma'am necessarily, but we were definitely taught respect. But there is a chain of command in the Army. And in any kind of military law enforcement branch, there is a chain of command. And this is the term that is used here in Ephesians 5 and verse 21, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Now my mom and dad would talk about sometimes a sergeant especially the drill sergeants, they could be brutes. And they would talk sometimes about some of their language and vulgarity and immorality and the wickedness of their life, whereas my mom and dad, thankfully, were both Christians when they were in the army, and they were definitely better people (laughs) morally. They were definitely better people as far as their conduct 
than a lot of the others who were even in superiority over them in rank. But they still submitted <laughs> in the army. They still submitted. They understood the chain of command. There was a role and a responsibility that they had within the army that they followed that chain of command and they lined up under. But we see here that this word submission is a, a term that we struggle with in, in our country. Uh, we struggle sometimes in churches with this. There's something about submitting one to another that gets to a particular root sin. It's our pride. Our pride really makes it hard for us to live out this one another principle. Because why should I line up under so-and-so? Why should I line up under that Yahoo? Why should I line up under, right? We, we make excuses. We rationalize. We even spiritualize. We make all kinds of excuses for what is oftentimes just outright rebellion, pride, thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, violating the principle of Philippians chapter 2, let Look not every man in his own things, but every man also in the things of others. But in chain of command, if a private comes to a sergeant and the sergeant commands him to do something, my understanding is that the private doesn't ask questions. He just does whatever the sergeant says. Now, what if the sergeant violates the lieutenant or the general's commands? There's a chain of command the sergeant is going to be punished. Now, the private, correct me if I'm wrong, the private might still get some punishment, but that sergeant is going to answer for his insubordination to the lieutenant or the general. So there is a responsibility of the lower rank to obey the higher rank, to submit, to line up under, to just do what they're told, knowing that if there's a wrong command, a violation of protocol or policy by the superior officer, his superior or her superior is going to deal with that individual who gave the wrong command or who did not uh, follow the, the policy and the procedures. I was just, uh, the 80th anniversary of D-Day, Normandy, the invasion of Normandy was about a, a little over a week ago now. I, I, I love history, so I spent a little bit of time that day <clears throat> watching some documentaries and going over some video and just in, just really kind of absorbing some of the, the history of that day. And I don't have all the statistics in front of me, but the volume of logistics that went into all of those watercraft, all of those allied forces, all of those beachheads, all of those uh, crafts that landed ashore, the air, uh, uh, the, the planes that flew in, and the paratroopers behind the scenes, an incredible, I don't know, I don't know what else to compare it to, I, I think that it's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, logistically speaking, military engagements of all time. To coordinate that many soldiers, that many watercraft, that many airplanes at that particular spot, even with some foul weather, and to do so and to engage the enemy and be victorious. Obviously providential, but still, from a human standpoint, incredible. Everybody had to follow their command. Everybody had to do what they were told to do precisely on that day. You go to the wrong spot at the wrong time, and you end up with blood on your hands, putting somebody in harm's way or not being where they should be to engage the enemy could open up the enemy's attacks upon some other part of the, the army, some other part of the allied forces. There was a precision because there had to be obedience, there had to be a following, there had to be a lining up under. Everybody had to do their part in order to be successful on that day. So that is the idea of submission. So we've seen submission defined. Let's look at submission characterized. I think that we have to look, first of all, at the greatest example of submission with all reverence and with all respect and in the fear of God. We see that there is submission within the Trinity. This boggles the mind. This is something even the early church wrestled with for hundreds of years. We've talked about that a little bit in our Sunday School series on church history. Within the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are one God, co-equal, 
in essence, in glory, in attributes, in character. Yet Christ submits to the Father as his Son, particularly in the Incarnation. Giving up the independent, ac at independent exercise of his divine attributes as he ministered here on the earth. To the point that he, when he was even saying, I am about my Father's business, not knowing even the, the, the day or the hour that, the, that God, that the, the Father would return, that he would return, excuse me, as, as uh, the Son of God to the earth. There is a submission within the Trinity, though equal in glory, co-equal in glory. There is a submission. Christ submitted to the Father as his Son. And again, particularly in the incarnation, the Holy Spirit, though co-equal in glory, co-equal in essence, in attribute, in character, he convicts of sin, indwells every believer, ministers comfort and consolation, points to Jesus, guides believers into all truth. <laughs> there is a submission within the Trinity that it requires a, an exercise of faith, doesn't it? We, we take what the Bible says and we believe it. And we must stay true to what the Bible says regarding the Trinity. Or else we get sideways and we ultimately gut the gospel of its very essence, its very truth. This doctrine is a foundational, fundamental doctrine that if we get this wrong, we get the gospel wrong. And souls, eternity is at stake. But there's a submission within the Trinity. The Father planned redemption, sent his Son, sovereignly carries out the plan of redemption throughout eternity, into and throughout eternity. The Son came and made the sacrifice, and he rose again. The Holy Spirit seals and guarantees the plan of redemption. We see this submission attacked today, don't we? We see authority attacked. We see children. We've spent some time on Wednesday nights looking at the commandments, and we looked at honor thy father and thy mother and dealt with this. I don't want to repeat all that, but we see that a lot of what's going on in our culture is direct rebellion. It's an attack upon authority. And I've brought it up, and I'm going to continue to hammer it, but critical theory is a Marxist can I say satanic attack upon God's authority? Critical theory has attacked God's design of authority. It's attacking God's authority. It's attacking the very character of God himself. According to critical theory, all evil in the world is directly attributable to power dynamics, mostly evident in systems of wealth and systemic structures of racism and now added to that, is sexual oppression. It's an attack. It's an attack upon man's submission to the God of the universe, to the Bible, to God's supreme authority. Jesus said, all power, all authority is given unto me in heaven and earth. Evolution. Evolution, is it not a direct attack upon the authority of God? Ultimately, evolution is, much as it's full of lies and falsehoods and deceptions, it is ultimately an about an attack upon the authority of God as creator of the universe. In critical theory, sin is eliminated almost entirely, particularly from certain groups of people. Any wrongdoing by people in these certain intersectional groups is blamed on an oppressor group or oppressor groups. I've just heard recently that a new attack on the authority of the Bible is a term, a phrase called sexual minorities. Even now saying that the eunuchs in the Bible represent a sexual minority group. It's incredible the lengths to which the LGBTQ community is going to attack the authority of God's word. And you look at critical theory and critical race theory and critical queer theory and all of that subcategories of critical theory, it ultimately comes down to this area of submission. Submission to God and to his authority. We go to 1 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3 and we read, But I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. So we have to recognize that all of us must be in submission to Christ, submitting yourselves one to another 
in the fear of God. So for us to get submission right in the home, in the workplace, among family members, in marriage, in all the other areas of life, in order for us to get submission right in those areas, we must be properly submitted to God, to Jesus Christ, who must have the preeminence. We must seek first the kingdom of God, set our affections on things above, walk worthy of the calling wherewith we are called. As believers, we submit to each other. We submit to each other in service, with humility, in giftedness, within roles of the family, the church, and society. I'm going to break this down just a little bit tonight. We go to John chapter 13, and we see submission by serving. Jesus washed the disciples' feet. There's multitudes of applications of how we submit by serving. Again, pride gets in the way. We don't serve like we should because we're too full of ourselves. That job is below me. That person doesn't deserve my time or attention. And that's in our culture, isn't it? As much as there's all these signs about love is love and be kind and all that, there's still a very rude, vulgar, cancel culture, however you want to describe it, that is just downright mean and rude and ugly. And again, I've, I don't want to get carried away with illustrations, but you all are in the working world and in the driving world and in the social world, and you see how rude and crude people are. And it's, it shouldn't be in the church. We should be different. We should be distinct in this way. We serve each other. That's part of our submission. We submit in conversation by not always interjecting ourselves into the conversation, by interrupting others, by always turning the conversation to ourselves. We submit in the home. All kinds of applications to this. You ever been in a home where you had to share a bathroom? One person, we all probably have to do that, right? Most of us don't have our own bathroom. Uh, one of the great things about dorm life at college, one of the great things and one of the not so great things about dorm life in college is sharing a bathroom. It teaches you. But think about, I mean, our first house, we were thankful we had two, two bathrooms. But as our family grew, there was more and more sharing. And with one girl, one daughter, and three boys, poor Emily has had to deal with sharing. And boys aren't always the cleanest. Well, girls aren't always the cleanest. Something about hair and drains. Can I talk about hair and drains? No, I don't want to talk about that. Submission in the home. Some of you know what it's like to have one or two bathrooms for a family of 10 plus. Right? You know what it's like. Taking turns, not taking too long in the bathroom. Those three minute or five minute showers. Can't do the 20 minute ones. We can go on and on with submission in the home, cleaning up after each other, cleaning up after ourselves, cleaning up messes, all the different chores. Well, it's not my job. I did that last time, and not, right? And we hear all that, excuses. Submission in the home includes doing the chores that, yes, we've been assigned to do, but also picking up the slack or going out of our way and helping out around the home where maybe it's not our particular job on that day or whatever, but it's still a need that needs to be taken care of, and we take care of it. I remember so many times and being thankful for having to work six years paying my way through college and seminary by working custodial. I did not have a glamorous job. I've used the illustration a lot. But God taught me a lot when I had to clean up puke in the elementary school in a coat and tie after I left class as a graduate assistant in seminary. And I'm a preacher boy. I'm going to be a pastor. And I'm down cleaning up vomit on the carpet in the elementary school. I'm cleaning toilets. But God taught me. It was good for me. And I learned a lot. Because when I got to Africa, and I learned the way some of those people live, I had another dose of humility. Big piece of humble pie I had to swallow. And still have to swallow. But all kinds of ways in which we submit in the home and sharing duties and responsibilities and putting things away. And then we, as our children get older, and we know how this is, as we've been there maybe with our own parents, sharing vehicles, not leaving the gas tank on empty and then handing the keys off to the next person. <laughs> all those things come into to play. 
Submitting in marriage, doing things together that maybe aren't our favorite, learning to love what each other loves, little compromises that we make in a good way, in a right way. Often it just takes communication, doesn't it? Even submission involves just communicating. Hey, honey, I'm going to be late. Um, I thought about this the other day and maybe a text message of a certain purchase and is this okay or not okay? And on and on we could go. Submitting in marriage. James 3 and verse 17, but the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated. That phrase, easy to be entreated, means willing to yield. That's, I know, a principle for all of life, but in marriage, how many times do we have to be willing to yield in order for the marriage to be godly, in order for it to please the Lord? James 3, verse 17 goes on, But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Some things in the home and marriage are not up for debate. Mom and dad have to be united about discipline of the kids, about church and attendance in church. Big decisions about financial purchases, homes. We have to be submissive. As we're looking for a home, we have our things that we list that we want. And we have to say, this is a do or die, and this is not a do or die. And we have things around the house. Again, I use us as men as examples. We would be fine with a file drawer for our clothes and a mattress on the floor. And our wives want a nice frame for the bed and decorations on the wall. And I I tell Young men in premarital counseling, you you just need to be willing to hang pictures. And you need to just be willing to put that nail in the wall and move it if you have to. Just just you just have to do that. It's important for your marriage. And it's okay. It's a good thing. Because our wives know how to make a house a home. We don't. (laughs) We as men struggle in making a house a home. But all kinds of ways in marriage that we have to submit one to another. And I know that's the immediate context because he then goes on and talks about wives and husbands and he even talks about in the church and the illustration there of Christ and his love for the church. But we submit, even in uh, maybe in, in meetings, um, whether it be church, business, not always having to interject our idea as if it's the only and the latest and the greatest and the best, not holding grudges and getting upset, thinking my idea is always better especially when there's money and there's influence and we have a way of which we throw our money around and our influence around. Submission. I've been in, I've been in meetings. I've been in staff meetings. I've been in building committee meetings. I've been in deacon meetings. I've been in all kinds of different meetings. And there is something about when people, when men or women in meetings can interject and they can bring up ideas and they can put things out on the table, but they don't get sideways about it and cantankerous about it. But have you ever been in a tense meeting where someone is trying to push something and there's resistance and sometimes that one that's pushing is pushing something that is carnal or not best. Sometimes they're pushing something that is right and good and even that has to be done delicately in moderation with gentleness, okay? All kinds of ways in which we submit, even in a committee meeting or in a a deacon's meeting, or whatever the meeting may be. We submit in church by giving other, others opportunity to serve and to lead, helping with tables and chairs, respecting others' knowledge, responsibilities, and leadership. I remember a time where there was a change in the chairman of the deacons at our church, and the former chairman got his feelings hurt and basically put his tail between his legs and stomped out of church and whined and cried because he was no longer the chairman. How sad. There was not the service and servant leadership that should have been there, sadly. It was about power and position. But I'm thankful for the unity God has blessed us with here at church. But think about all the ways in which we submit one to another in church. Building. I mean, we're all very submissive in some ways to Kim Holt because he's got such knowledge. But at the same time, there's input. We're going to talk about some of that in the deacon's meeting, think about in music. Pam does a lot of the coordination with music. I submit to her a lot in music, and she submits to me in 
we as a music team submit to each other when it comes to music, because that's a ministry that we share in. Think about security. I don't try to micromanage Denny. There's a submission that I give to Denny, and Denny gives to me. I'm the pastor of this church, but no, I don't mean it that way. That's not my attitude. I don't want it to be that way, but we communicate, and we things around the building, things that get moved and changed and replaced or whatever. There's communication that's part of submission. Finances. Think about sound and video. I don't micromanage uh, Drew up there, but we communicate. We, we talk, and we work out things, and if the sound isn't quite right, we get feedback or whatever, you know, the video. Uh, the youth ministry, Sunday school, children's ministries, a lot of ministries going on, and we submit one to another in the fear of God in those ministries. I'll say it uh, repeatedly. I'm not the fourth person of the Trinity. I am not the Holy Spirit in your lives. I try to apply the word of God and provide leadership as God leads. But we have to submit one to another, and that includes communication, and that includes putting uh, sometimes our feelings aside and our pride aside and saying, what about this? What about that? And trusting. And we know what, what I'm trying to say here about submission and how important it is in the church with various ministries and how we can get upset if we're not careful and we get possessive and we begin to take ownership of certain ministries or even people, they will donate something to the church and then they want to put possession on it. And they get very, very particular about, well, I, that's got to be used. A certain, I'm not joking. There was an individual that we had in our former ministry, and her boys had sat on a particular bench 30 years ago for their nursery pictures. And we could not take that bench out of the nursery because her boys had been on that 30 years ago and had had their picture taken. And she had donated that to the nursery, and it was a ownership, possession, <laughs> that it was, I, I don't know if it's still there in the nursery now, but it's, it was one of those things where that, that was her prized possession, and it had to be in the nursery, and it had to be certain places dangerous when we start to get that way, because it's, this isn't my church, this is God's church, this isn't anybody's church here individually, it's God's church, we have to keep that in mind in our submission to one, one to another. There's a sermon in each of these, but we have to go on tonight. don't want to keep you too late, but we see, of course, in the applications of Ephesians 5, and beginning at verse 22, we see submission. Women, wives, submit yourselves. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. So we submit ourselves one to another in the fear of God. Wives, equal in humanity with men. Remember that. They're equal to us. Two eyes, two perspectives. Yet come under God first and to their husbands, to men in the family, in the church. We can go to Genesis 3, 16, 1 Corinthians 14, 34, right here in Ephesians 5 and verse 22, Colossians 3, 18. We can talk about in 1 Timothy 2 and Titus 2 about women being silent in the churches, not having a pastoral leadership role. The Southern Baptist Church just dealt with that. And from what I understand, the SBC's attempt to have a rule for their churches that there can be no ordained pastoral duties for or pastoral role for women. And I understand that rule got shot down. You look at the pattern in denominations. You look at the pattern in denominations. Disobedience in that area about women being pastors, being ordained, that has opened the doors to all kinds of error. Because it's an area of disobedience. And it has opened up now for many of the mainline denominations that have fractured. It began with a disobedience in this area. And now they have opened the floodgates to LGBTQ and all that. And there's a pattern there. It's interesting. This is not a misogynist sermon. This is not about male chauvinism. This is about simply obedience to what the Bible says. So there's a... Equality in humanity with man, with men, yet there's a submission, first of all, to God and to husbands and to men within the family, within the church, in those particular contexts, according to biblical principles uh, that must be applied. And I understand that sometimes men are abusive in their leadership roles, power hungry and on an ego trip and 
There are ministries that have failed. There are ministries that are not right or have completely even dissolved because of wrong male leadership. So let's pick on the husbands for a minute. Equal in humanity with women, yet come under God with the responsibility to do what? To love our wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. That should, take, that should knock us men off of our ego trips because Christ came to minister. I told young ladies, look for a man who is a servant. Has a backbone. He's not a jellyfish. He's not a milk toast husband or potential husband, but make sure he's a servant, that he has some humility about his life. If you start to see in this young man that he is a fool of himself and he's arrogant and the way he treats his mom and his sister is very condescending toward them, watch out, major red flag. Is he a submissive young man? Because that servant spirit is going to have to come out in marriage. We see a lot of men who treat their wives like doormats. And that's not the way Christ treated the church. He came as the God-man, the incarnation, was obedient even to the death of the cross, paid the penalty for our sin. We're to love our wives as Christ loved the church. So there's submission in the home among the husband and the wife. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, verse 23, and he is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Why, how, or for what purpose? That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. The husband is to lead the home and to love his wife as Christ loves the church for the purpose of her sanctification. The book that I often use in premarital counseling is a book by Jim Binney called The Ministry of Marriage. Because it's about ministering to one another. I talk about all the time about marriage is 100, 0, 99, 1. On your worst day, it's 95, 5. And you're the one giving the 100 and the 99 and the 95. It's the ministry of marriage. It's the service. 27, verse 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holding without blemish. God's going to hold us men accountable for how we have led our homes, how we have led our wives. Have we brought sanctification into the home? Have we had godliness in the home? Have we led our wives in a way that they can grow in their relationship with the Lord? Or have we stomped on her and stepped on her and treated her like a doormat and run over her? We're going to be held accountable. That's not going to bring her closer to Christ when we're treating her like that. We know there's warnings in Proverbs. We know that there's the contentious woman and the brawling woman and the man who's in the corner of the housetop, rather than be in the home with the woman who's a brawler or a nagger or a contentious woman. Okay, but what caused her to be that way? I often think, what made her to be a nag, to be a contentious woman, to be a brawling woman? What has he done? Because oftentimes when we as husbands treat our wives right, they blossom like roses, like flowers. I realize that there's a character and an individual responsibility she has before God, but many times... She's not blooming and blossoming like a rose because we as men, we're not watering the flower. We're not being kind and gracious and loving and sacrificial and serving. What about masters and employers? What about submitting in the workplace? Ephesians 6 and verse number 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart. And notice what the phrase again, as unto Christ. We've seen in verse 21, in the fear of God, we see as Christ is the head of the church, we see the church is subject unto Christ, we see as Christ also loved the church, we see wives submit as unto the Lord, we see in verse number 5 of chapter 6, as unto Christ. We see this principle of submitting to one another being again, first of all, in our relationship with God, our submission to Christ. We see it over and over. We're to faithfully do our job as unto the Lord. We're to do our job sweetly, quickly, completely. We're maybe willing to take the extra shift to stay a little longer. We step up to do a job. We respond with grace when undermined and undercut. We can really be a testimony for God in the workplace when we exercise a humility. I realize that may sometimes cost us a promotion or a raise, and not that we don't 
defend ourselves and do our part and go to the manager or whatever the protocols are. But when we as believers are cutting the hours short and cutting corners and undermining and being disrespectful and being lazy, what, what does that say about our testimony? What does that say about our relationship with God? We don't always get it right, but we've tried to teach our children that if there's a, an extra shift that comes available, go ahead and take it when you can. Show up on time or early, early, really, not just on time, show up early. Be willing to, to, to go the, the extra mile at work and do the extra job, even the one that's not the most pleasant. Being willing to volunteer for those things. There's so many areas, and we see, I mean, I, I sat in a barber shop not that long ago, and all this guy could do while I was waiting to get my hair cut is he complained about Alcoa down here, uh, or Conic, I guess it's now, right? They have the big water tower that says Alcoa, and there's an Alcoa gas station, I think, on the corner. But anyway, it's Arconic. Um, Arconic, right? Yeah. And he sat there, and he complained the whole time while I was sitting there waiting to get my hair cut. And he was like, Arconic is going to be gone in two years because, and he just went, and he just complained up one side and down the other. And I thought, what kind of an employee is this? <laughs> what kind of an attitude does he have at work if all he's doing is complaining, griping? Go in and do your job and do it right. Uh, we often tell our kids, be the person that makes someone smile. Be the person that is a joy to be around, that helps the customer. One of our children was working at the grocery store and a mystery shopper came through and got, he got a raise. He got a raise because the mystery shopper came through and this is by the grace of God and to his testimony, thank the Lord, this mystery shopper turned in a good report and it gave him a raise. He had no idea. He was just sitting there doing the bag and the groceries or whatever and, and the mystery shopper gave him good, good marks and he got a raise from his manager. Praise the Lord. You never know who's watching, but God is always watching, isn't he? And then we can go on uh, submitting to spiritual leaders. Hebrews 13 and verse number 17 just doesn't mean that the, the pastor, the deacons, that they have absolute authority and can never be questioned. That's not at all the attitude. Um, that's not biblical. Um, obviously, that's gotten a lot of men in trouble in the ministry. But obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. And then a really, really hard one is government. Let me back up here. Did I put that one on there? I think it's on the screen. Romans 13 and verse number 1. And I need to turn back there in my, in my Bible as we come to a, a, a close here tonight. I want to put a chart up. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. We're to be respectful citizens, keep the laws of the nation, as long as they don't violate the laws of God, of course. We're to be submissive in society. What about speed limits? Uh-oh. We can all get in trouble there, right? What about no parking zones? What about handicap spots? We had an individual in our church, our former ministry, he was in a wheelchair and drove a handicap accessible type van. And he got so upset sometimes because people would park across the striped lines and he couldn't get back in his vehicle. He'd go into a restaurant or a grocery store and take care of his business there and he'd come out and he couldn't get back in his vehicle because somebody had parked across those striped lines. He couldn't get the ramp down to get back in his van. And he would have to go back into the store and they'd have to make a call over the intercom and have somebody come out and move their vehicle. How rude. You know, that, that's part of, I think, being submissive in society and being respectful to others. I know there's all kinds of applications, but putting carts away at the grocery store, having boys that worked at a grocery store, uh, it's important that you put your carts away. I know there are exceptional circumstances. You don't want to leave a baby and walk 100 yards to put your cart away when you have a baby by himself or herself in the van. I understand there's exceptions, but putting carts away. What about paperwork? I get tired of red tape, but being a good citizen sometimes is doing the, the, the duty of the paperwork, the red tape that we have to do. Taxes, ugh, but we have to do them, right? 
The government's authority is not absolute, and that's what I want to close tonight. I put together, this isn't the best, but we know God's authority is supreme. But we have three rings, and in submitting one to another in the fear of God, and as we look at the various roles, we have to sometimes see that there is some overlap. The church I purposely put on top, but it does it not intersect with the family? Of course it does. Family should be in church. There's a role the church plays in the family. I mentioned this morning about the fathers being the patriarch, in a sense, of the family and bringing them to church and being faithful and serving and sacrificing and being that good example and showing that God is important, God is first in dad's life and how that affects the family. And church is an integral part of that. But then they have the government. I made it a little bit smaller. I put it down below because the government's role is really, ultimately, in submission, of course, to God, but even to the church and to the family in a lot of ways. When we do a restroom expansion, we've done this in previous building projects at our former ministries, but do we still look at code? Do we get the proper permits? Sure. And that is for safety and also for, I know the government's taking taxes and fees and all, I get that. But some of that is just about safety and out of respect for the county and the city that we don't block water and sewer or in this case, a septic tank, but there's ways in which that affects safety and also shows respect for others. We had to spend a lot of money in our former ministry on a particular clean out because of the way the property was built. And we found out when we were building that the owner of a home back behind had cheated and had tapped into the city sewer or city water, city sewer line illegally and it caused a hang-up in our building project, and we had to go through the city. And thankfully, with a Christian contractor, we went to the city, and with the right attitude, we said the, previ- or the, the owner of this house behind tapped into the city sewer, and we want to be upfront about this. And the city respected and granted us a provision to tap back in, or to keep that, excuse me, to keep that connection, and to grant a... Um, exception or however they dealt with that house behind us. But we did the right thing. We went to the city and we said, here is something, and we had the inspectors come out. All that is part of, okay? We had to build a big firewall at our previous ministry and interrupted a long hallway because they wanted to have us put in a sprinkler system, which would have cost ten thousands of dollars more. And we went to the city and we appealed can we put in a firewall and save us from having to spend tens of thousands of dollars on a sprinkler system? And they granted that. There's ways we can work with, and that's for safety and respect for others. But we're not going to bow to the government when they they want to close our church down, when they want to throw me in prison. They can throw me in prison. They might throw me in prison for speaking up against LGBT and abortion, and there's people going to prison now for uh, some of the things are Jack Phillips is going to be going before the Supreme Court because he won't write a customized message on a cake to promote and celebrate sexual perversion. We're facing that more and more, aren't we? There's not an absolute authority of government. There is a point where we have to say we're going to obey God rather than men. But we see that interaction. We see that um, and again, it's not the, maybe the best illustration, but it's a way in which we see that overlap and that intersection that all is a part of this submitting one to another in the fear of God. Hope this has made sense tonight and been a help to us this evening. Uh, thank you for your faithfulness and being here. Let's close in a word of prayer and then we'll have uh, Derek come with our closing song tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word that speaks so practically and so relevantly to issues that we face right here and now in the home in society, in relationships. And Lord, help us to apply biblical truth in all of these areas. Help us, Lord, to not be ignorant or foolish or rebellious or disobedient. Help us, Lord, to be wise as serpents, but innocent as as doves. Lord, help us as we navigate through this to, Lord, truly have the biblical attitude of being submissive submissive one to another, ultimately in the fear of God unto Christ. We pray that you will bless in our homes, in our families, in our church, in our lives throughout this week. uh, To your honor and to your glory, may we be faithful and obedient to you, you, we pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Derek's going to come and lead us in number 98 in our hymn books. My God is a righteous God. Won't we stand? Find hymn number 98 as Derek leads us. Stands the number one of My God is a righteous God. <laughs> 